Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, musical greetings. We at the PG Department of Computer Science extend a very warm welcome to all the participants to this webinar on data analytics and applications. When computers came into existence, the data moved from vendors to systems. They were just we data. The when it cloud computing the came system. into existence, so the, the data left the buildings and the data slowly emerged towards metadata. And when analytics came, data has become central and data has become the driving force enabling businesses and organizations to take the right decisions. Today, we have Mr. Hemant as the resource person who did his bachelor's in engineering in Tamil Nadu and moved to Canada for higher education in business administration. He is presently working in the data analytics domain in Canada and also working as visiting faculty in the York University, Canada. Today, he will be addressing to us from Toronto, Canada. Our webinar today will have two sessions and each session has got its own query session. So I request the participants to pay attention to this announcement. I repeat, our webinar today will have two sessions and each session has got its own query sessions. I request the participants to make a note of it. Bishop Heber College is a pioneer in quality higher education and I'm very much excited and elated to announce that we have been ranked 39th in the National Institutional Ranking Framework by the Ministry of Human Resource and Development, Government of India, yesterday. Last year, academic year, we secured the 44th rank and we have moved five places. And this year, we have scored the 39th rank in India. Our journey towards excellence is spearheaded by the Almighty and it is imperative to praise and worship for all the good things that God has done to us. May I now request Dr. R. Jemima Priyadarshini, Associate Professor, Department of Computer Science, Bishop Eva College, to lead us with the opening prayer. Okay. Almighty God, I pray that you will and thank you for this wonderful evening. Lord, I pray for our management, principal, head of the department, and staff members, especially for the participants. Father, bless all our endeavors, especially today's meeting. Guide us in our discussions. Enlighten our minds. Give us your grace that we may effectively do our work. Bless each and every one of us, especially, Lord, I pray for the resource person. Bless him more and more. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Today, we have participants from Saudi Arabia, Ghana, United Kingdom, Canada, Singapore, Oman, Australia, Maldives, and United States, and all the states in India. I extend a very warm welcome to all the participants. And over to you, Heman, sir. Sir, uh, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I have to say, um, so thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sobers, um, for this great opportunity. I see this as a great opportunity. I, I have, I'm very passionate about, um, not just about learning, but also about sharing all that I have learned as well. And that's what has got to me, um, got me to where I am right now. Um, and also, um, thank you. I forget the name of the other, um, other person and the other staff member um, for that beautiful uh, prayer. So thanks for all of that. I'm going to begin right now. I will share my screen in one second. As we begin this, I also wanted to say to everybody that um, I have a feeling that I will take probably the full hour. So it will go on for about uh, the, the next 60 minutes. So I'm hoping it will not be a problem for anybody. Um, here in Canada, the time is 8.45 in the morning, um, so we will go on at, until about 9.45. I think uh, it will be 
um, 7.15 um, in the evening for India. So that's the plan that I have. Um, so let's get started. Uh, good evening to everybody in India. Um, good morning to everybody from uh, US and Canada if you're dialing from here. If you're dialing from any other country, hello to all of you. Um, I know it is quite hard uh, to have an interaction via Zoom, um, and this is the new normal for us, uh, but it's, I, I, I'm glad to know that everybody is safe and doing well and have been able to join this uh, call. So thank you so much for that. Um, but just in terms of interaction, um, this is, I know this is not my usual lecture, less lecture class uh, with my university students. So I won't be able to interact a lot, um, but uh, at least I'm hoping that we will have a couple of questionnaire sessions where you may be able to ask questions. Okay. Um, moving on to analytics. So um, analytics is, Analytics is such a hot topic right now. Sorry, um, just as a courtesy, if I were to ask you guys to please stay on mute. Sorry for disturbance. Sir, the host can mute all the participants, Mike. If possible, you mute it, sir. Daddy! Okay. Sorry, can I mute uh, everybody as well? Is that a possibility? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You can mute all the... Okay. I think it's good now. Okay, so as I was saying, analytics is such a hot topic right now, and everybody is talking about analytics. And um, hopefully by the end of the session, I will be able to give you guys an overview of what analytics is about. And we'll also be going through some of the um, most common or the latest trends in analytics. And also, I'm going to ask uh, some help uh, from Dr. Sobers. Is there a way to get this, uh, this neat little drawing out? Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that. Okay, so um, just to give you guys an overview of what we will be looking at in the next one hour, we will be looking at an introduction to analytics. First. So I would just, uh, I have to mention this yesterday, um, there were a few people that reached out to me knowing that I'm doing this webinar. They said, I'm totally new into, into analytics. I do not know anything about analytics. So if, that's, if it's possible for you, if you can talk about introduction to analytics, just give me an introduction on what analytics is. Um, um, and and I just want to make sure that I have that confidence within the, the webinar. So we will be talking about what analytics is, first of all, before we jump into uh, some of the trends that we see in analytics today. So that will be the first part. And the second session, will be, we will be hitting up on the three trends that I wanted to talk about. One is going to be about big data. The other one is machine learning and artificial intelligence. And then we will also be looking at internet of things as well. And finally, I also want to end this webinar um, talking about now that we've gone through what analytics is, now that we've gone through some of the latest and, and hottest trends in analytics, I want to also give you guys some tips in case if you're, uh, if you're new, to, new in the industry or if you want to get into the analytics field, what are the things that you have that you're supposed to do? I will be sharing three tips with you guys. So that is the plan. Just on a lighter note, I wanted to start the session with a cartoon. Okay. So what you see here is that it's a fortune teller, a crystal ball gazer, um, has, ha, she has left her job and gets into the analytics field. And um, this is something that is very common. I know this is just for fun, but this is, this is something that is very common in the industry that these days, everybody wants to get into analytics, be it they are already into IT or they are into computer science. They all, all of them want to, uh, they want to get into uh, predictive analytics, specifically, specifically into analytics. And um, yeah, so everybody wants to join the bandwagon and then we'll find out why is that analytics is so hot. And if that's the case, we'll also look at what exactly analytics is all about. Okay. Um, before I start with the content that I have in my presentation, I also wanted to give a little bit of background on, on what I can do in this seminar. Right. Um, and also, if you look at this slide, I'm carefully wording it as what I can offer because I see this as an offering. Um, I don't want to have a flashy slide with a, uh, this is the intention is not to have a flashy slide about all that I have done in the past. 
this is just to give you guys an idea on some of the experiences that I've had in the past. Um, that way you get an idea on within analytics. Analytics is such a big ocean. Um, within analytics, uh, you will get an idea on what I have done. I have, as you can see here, I have been with a, with a bunch of companies in the recent past. And um, I think I lost my screen. Just one second. Yep. So analytics is a, is a big ocean. Um, but when it comes to that, um, all that I have done in my career is uh, retail analytics, any kind of analytics specific to retail. So basically, I have about 15 years of experience in the, in the analytics field. And I started off with uh, Tata Consultancy Services uh, back in, uh, in India, in Chennai. And after that, um, I have uh, worked with uh, Nokia in Finland. Then I moved on to uh, do my MBA in, uh, in Canada. This was about 11, 12 years ago. Um, I've uh, worked with a bunch of companies, as you can see here. Um, currently, I'm working with a retailer, a home improvement retailer based out of the US. Um, it's called the Home Depot. So I'm a senior manager of data science and analytics within Home Depot. Um, right now, I am also um, in the past, uh, since the past one year, I have also been um, teaching um, at uh, Schulich School of Business, uh, which is uh, a part of York University in Toronto, Canada. And I, I teach uh, a marketing analytics course uh, for the second year MBA students. If you also were to think about uh, what my key competencies are, um, I, in the past 15 years, most of the stuff that I have done are customer analytics, anything to do with customers, understanding customer behaviors, looking at the data and understanding more about it. So customer analytics and campaign analytics is something that I've done quite a bit. Um, loyalty analytics is also another uh, thing that I have uh, worked on and mission learning is just so hot right now. And uh, in the past uh, five, six years, I have also started uh, doing machine learning as well. Now that I have spoken about myself, I wanted to take a bit of time um, to understand about you all. I want to make sure that uh, my content is sort of customized to what you guys, um, what you, what you all might be expecting, and what your backgrounds are. So, all of you, if I can ask, uh, if you're using a phone or if you're using a laptop, just go to menti.com, m-e-n-t-i.com, and hit the code thirty-six ten ninety-five. So you will be, so you will be um, posted with a question on Menti. So as I said, for the people that have not joined yet, go to menti.com and then um, hit this code number, 36, I think it's 10 and 55. So where are you from? Sir, could you repeat the code, please, sir? 36, sure. 10, 0, and 55. Five. So it's 36, 10, 95. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The code is available in the chat box. Please look at the chat box. Please. Uh, I request the participants not to scribble anything on your uh, screen. It is visible on the presentation screen. Kindly avoid scribbling on your screen. I request the participants to visit menti.com and hit the code 36109595, please. So uh, I see 75 people um, having answered so far. I'm going to wait until 100 and then uh, I want to move on to the next question. So, how are you? All right, so most of the folks are from Tamil Nadu, um, and uh, 11 people are outside of India. Again, I've got uh, a little over 100 participants uh, answer this question. So I think this is good. Uh, so this gives me an idea on where people are. So yeah, most of them are from Tamil Nadu, some people from other states, and uh, we have uh, a little bit outside of India as well. Okay, amazing. So let's go to the next question. So guys, um, it may seem as if it's a quiz. It's actually not a quiz. Um, you will see a question there. The question is, what is your current education, 
educational background or a professional background? Select one of these options. Are you a student? Are you a teacher or a professor? Are you a professional? Are you into analytics or IT? Or are you an entrepreneur? I think there are some issues with uh, with this question, so I'm going to skip this. I'm going to go to the next one instead. Um, the, you will see on your screen right now, if you refresh your screen, you will see three different questions. I mean, you will see three different uh, responses that you can um, input. Why are you attending this seminar? Interested in the topic? Professional experience? Okay. To gain knowledge, insights, amazing. Interest, latest ideas. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. To gain knowledge. Okay. okay. Okay, that's amazing. Uh, I'm going to stop it right here. So what I get out of this is that basically most of the people just want to gain knowledge out of this. Um, that's amazing. So let's move on to the presentation itself. All right. So now that the poll is over, I have an idea on where you guys are from, uh, what you what back, backgrounds you're in from, and uh, what your expectations are from the course. Okay. So I also want to do it from my side. What is the expectations that you can get uh, from this uh, webinar? Um, from my standpoint, who is this for? If you are a data science student or if you're an actual science student, um, this would be a, a very good uh, fit for you. And if you're already an analytics professional, of course, this could be a good refresher for you. If you're if you are a student with computer science background, um, yes. And uh, same thing in case if you just want to be, uh, if you just want to keep up with the trends in terms of analytics, this would be for you. Uh, just in terms of the depth of uh, uh, of the webinar. I'm not going to go very deep into the concepts because I don't see this as a lecture. I have my I have my own class that I have uh, at the university that's very different. So it's not going to be very lecture-like. So I won't get too deep into the concepts. At the same time, I also want to give you guys an exposure to all these concepts, um, but it won't be too much of a, uh, of a high level either. Okay. So now, um, having said all of that, I'm going to get into what exactly is analytics. Guys, let's be honest. I know um, there could be some people that might really not know what exactly is analytics. Uh, you might have heard of this word. Um, you might have heard this buzzword everywhere, but you might not really know what exactly analytics means. If that's the case, just raise your hand. You can raise your hand uh, uh, pressing Alt-Y. If you press Alt-Y, you can raise your hand. If you feel that, you know what, I, I honestly do not know what analytics is. Just give me an idea on what that is. Yeah, I'm expecting that there, quite a, there will be quite a bit of people that might not have known what that is. So let me just give you guys an idea on what it is, right? So first of all, you may think, is it actually reporting? I am into business intelligence and reporting right now. Can you call that as analytics? You might also think, I also do data visualization. I'm into Tableau. I use many other data visualization tools. Is that analytics? You might also think, I do data analysis. I do data mining. I pull data and I drill down into data and I do mining, is that analytics? You might also, you might also think, uh, leave alone all those guys that does reporting. I am into statistics, I'm a statistician, and I do analysis using um, uh, highly complicated, highly complex statistical analysis, is that analytics? And you might also think, uh, I am into machine learning, is that actually analytics? The answer is, it's a combination of all three. Um, all these five, um, that is what is analytics. With analytics, it, there is not one fine definition to say this is exactly what is analytics and this is what is reporting or analysis or whatever. Analytics is, is basically a combination of all of these together. Now, I wanna introduce you guys into something called analytics continuum. And the reason behind why I call this as continuum is that there are first of all, four categories of analytics. Um, and that's what I call as DDPP. There are four different categories. However, 
the distinction between each of these categories are very, very blurry. You cannot, you cannot really distinctively say this is category number one, this is category number two, only because that it is sort of a continuum. It starts off with the most basic analytics and it, it, uh, it ends with the highest level of advanced analytics. Now, if you, if I were to um, show you um, how this can be plotted into a graph, if you were to think about um, a graph that is plotted in terms of difficulty, how hard is it to do analytics? And on, a, on the other um, axis, if they have value, how much value does it add to the business? How much value does it add to the organization? Um, this is how it would look like. The first category of analytics is descriptive analytics. Anything to do with descriptive analytics is very easy to do. At the same time, it also does not add so much of value to the business. Now, if you move on to the other three ca categories, you have diagnostic analytics, and then you have predictive analytics, you also have prescriptive analytics. Now let's look at um, each of these in, in detail. When you look at uh, descriptive analytics, it basically talks about what happened in the past. You're describing the data, you're describing a historical event, what happened in history. If you look at diagnostic analytics, you are not looking at what happened, you already know what happened, but now you wanna know what caused that to happen, what was the factor behind it, or what drove that to happen. When it comes to predictive analytics, now that you know what happened, what drove it, you want to know what will happen in future. You want to predict the future based on the historical data that you have. Now, if you get into prescriptive analytics, you're going even one step further to say, now that I know what is going to happen in future, I want to make sure that I change the future a little bit based on what my prescriptive analytics is going to um, tell me. Now, um, I don't want to stop the theory. I also want to give you guys some examples of each of these so that you this, this these concepts um, sink into your uh, into your brain. Okay. Now, when it comes to say, for example, if I if I run a store in Toronto, no, let's say I'm running I, I run a store in Chennai for that matter, right? So I have a store in Chennai, and uh, there are many companies that do not even do any kind of analytics, which means that they don't really know what is happening in the business. If they don't look at data, that means that they cannot really make any decisions out of it. Um, let's say I run a little store in Chennai and, um, and I have a database, I, I do descriptive analytics. With descriptive analytics, I would be able to know what happened in terms of sales for my store in the past two years. Say for example, I generated let's say um, $1 million or, or 1 million Indian, uh, Indian rupee um, um, two years ago, um, sorry, last year, but in the previous year, I generated $1.2 million. That means that my sales is down compared to the previous year. So that is descriptive analytics. Now, if I were to say, now that I know that my sales has gone down, my sales has declined, but I wanna know what triggered it. Say for example, if the answer, if the reason behind that is that customers left my organization. There are a lot of people that used to shop with me. A bunch of folks, a segment of people are not shopping with me. If I have found that out, how did I find that out? I did it using diagnostic analytics. Now, if I were to uh, predict the future of the sales um, of, my, of, of the store that I'm running, say for example, if I, if I, own, I wanna know at the end of 2020, I wanna know how much sales am I going to make, then that is predictive analytics. Now, let's say the predictive analytics is going to say, this year you generated one, $1 million, but in the following year, you're not even going to hit $1 million. You're going to have a decline, even a further decline, to let's say $800,000. And if that's the case, if I want to make sure that my future has to be changed, if I want to grow my business to let's say $1.5 million, then prescriptive analytics is going to tell me what are the things that I'm supposed to do to be able to get to that future. And that's what that is. Now let's look at some examples and then we'll move on to the next slide. Descriptive analytics is any kind of BI reporting that you do, any kind of reporting on Tableau and, and whatnot, that is descriptive analytics. Now, when it gets to diagnostic analytics, you're going a little bit further, you're looking at drill downs, you're doing some data mining using SAS or Python and, what, and whatnot. When it comes to predictive analytics, you are into machine learning. For example, you're forecasting sales, and that could be a predictive um, analytics model. Uh, if it gets to prescriptive analytics, it, it, is, it is much more advanced. For example, you do something called Monte Carlo simulation, and that, get, that is into prescriptive analytics. Now, if you look at value, um, 
Descriptive analytics is everything about the past, and that's why it's hindsight. You want to get an insight into what happened in the past, and that is what this is. When it comes to diagnostic analytics and a little bit of predictive analytics, it's insight. You are understanding what's, what's happening in the business so that you can make a better decision. When it comes to prescriptive analytics, it's about foresight. What do I want to do in future? And that is what is prescriptive analytics. Now, moving on, I want to put all of that together. So now we look at the, uh, the four different categories of analytics, descriptive, diagnostic, predictive, and prescriptive. Now I want to put it all together. Now, if you look at this, you have data. In any organization, you have data. And then you want to make a decision. All that in a business, in a business, all that you want to do is to take data and use data to make a decision. And once you made a decision, you want to act upon it. And that's all you want to do. Now, if you use analytics, you could see that you want to use analytics. And at the same time, there is also a little bit of human input that is involved as well. When it comes to descriptive, you could see that there is a lot of human input that is uh, necessary. As you go down the pipeline, you could see that with predictive analytics, there is very, very less human input uh, required because the machine or the computer is going to tell you what should you actually be doing. So your decision making is easy and your action, uh, your action is also very easy. Now, interestingly, if you look at prescriptive analytics, um, the, you could get to see that um, there is a possibility that prescriptive analytics can just take decision making, making totally out of the question. You, it does not require any human input at all, and you will be able to make a decision. The computer will be able to make a decision for you. And um, we're not there yet right now. Um, if you were to think about self-driving uh, self cars, that's a good example of what prescriptive analytics is, because um, a computer is able to make decision on your behalf, um, and human input is totally cut out, and it just goes straight into action. And that's purely um, artificial intelligence. Now, with that background, I, I hope that by now you have a good understanding of um, um, what analytics is. And now we will get into um, some of the latest trends that we have in, in the, in the uh, market right now. We will get into big data first, and then we will go to the other two. <clears throat> Again, big data, just like analytics, is such a buzzword. Everybody likes to talk about big data. Um, honestly, not everybody know about uh, knows about uh, big data, but they just like to use that buzzword. I'm not talking about just students or or anybody in the in the academic field, but I'm actually talking about people um, in organizations that talk about big data. Now, I want to give you guys an idea on what big data is. If you take so, what I have here, the stats, the, the statistics that I have here is from 2019. In the internet. Every minute, every 60 seconds, there's so much of data that is getting generated. If you, if you take a look at Instagram, there are closer to 300,000. Um, it's 2.8, closer to 2.8 lakhs of uh, Instagram user posts that, that just get uh, generated. And if you look at Twitter, about half a million, about five lakhs of tweets get uh, generated. And what is this? This is all data. And if you look at emails, it's, I don't, I can't even count. I think it's what, it's in billions, 100, 188 uh, billion, it's huge. So with every, every second, and here we're talking about 60 seconds, in 60 seconds, there is so much of data that is getting generated in the internet. So we live in a world where um, there are so many new systems and so many platforms like social media platforms where data is constantly, continuously being generated. This brings up, brings about a good challenge for us, and at the same time, there is also a great opportunity as well. Why? Um, first of all, uh, the challenge is that our traditional systems, take for example, a Microsoft SQL Server. Can you fit all this data into a Microsoft SQL Server? Mm, you actually cannot because of the volume of data and also the variety of data that you get. So that is a challenge. And the opportunity that you get out of this is that now that you have massive amounts of data, you'll be able to make better decisions on behalf of your customers. So a few things that I really want you guys to think about. One is you want to think about, do we actually have the systems that I can use to store uh, such massive amounts of data? You also want to think about, now that I have the data, I also want to think about, how do I analyze this data? Because if we don't analyze uh, the data, it's just going to sit in your database and you're not going to um, use it at all. Um, and at the same time, you also want to think about what do you want to do with it? How am I going to make a decision out of it? Now, moving on. I'm pretty sure uh, most of you might have known about this. Everybody likes to talk about the Vs behind uh, big data. 
Some people say it's three Vs. Some people say it's six Vs. I just picked up four Vs. To be honest with you, um, big data is just a common phrase that everybody likes to use. But if you think about it, um, there is no proper definition of big data. Say, for example, uh, even if you were to look at the four Vs that are that that um, constitutes what big data is, um, you want to look at uh, volume. If you have huge volumes of data, then you can call it big data. However, there is no distinct distinction to say, oh yes, now my database has reached uh, 512 GB, and now I'm I can call that I can say that I I have big data. There is no such thing. There is no delineation to say this is big data and this is small data. There is no such thing. Um, so basically, it is just, just a general term where if you have huge amount of, uh, of uh, um, data in petabytes and, and uh, zettabytes, then um, you would call that as big data. Um, and uh, also in terms of variety as well, if you think about the variety, um, if, you look, if you look at the, some of the data that you get from social media, you get structured data. At the same time, you also get unstructured data as well. If you think about how many likes to have a, uh, received on a post, that is structured data. But unstructured data is the actual comment that uh, your users might be putting in. Or if somebody was to tweet, that is data as well. Your tweet is data, but it does not have any structure. There is no column. There is no row. Um, so it's basically not a relational database. So that is unstructured. Um, velocity as well, um, um, the speed in which data comes in which means the speed um, with which processing needs to happen, that is also immense. And that's what is called uh, big data. Now, also veracity, I like to add veracity as well because there is so much uncertainty in terms of data. Um, you would not know how much of data that you would get at any point in time, it's always fluctuating. And at the same time, you might not know what, is, what might be useful for you and what might not be useful for you. One last thing that I want to talk about about big data on this slide is that it is not a thing of the future. It is current and big data is existing right now. And it's just that we need to think about how do we as companies or, or professionals, how do we prepare for big data? Okay. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this slide, but I just want to leave you guys with, uh, with an impression that big data is not something that you can have on uh, have on prem or on premises. Dr. Sobers just uh, talked about it at the very beginning to say upon the advent of cloud computing, data moved on to um, uh, moved on elsewhere, and it's not sitting within an organization. That is actually true. Specifically, especially with big data, data does not sit on prem. Um, you could do it, but it's just that it's very expensive. It's not scalable. So it's best to move it to uh, to the cloud. Um, one quick point about uh, uh, some of the vendors that we have, uh, most common vendors that we have in terms of cloud computing is a uh, Google Cloud Platform, and Azure is the Microsoft tool, um, Microsoft solution in terms of cloud computing. Amazon also has, uh, has got its own, uh, which is Amazon um, Web Services, AWS. And uh, yeah, for faster scalability, if you want to scale up and scale down, um, of big data, you definitely want to go into big, uh, you want to go into cloud computing instead, um, rather than having it on premise at your um, at your organization. Again, uh, there is a little bit of a technicality here, so I don't really want to spend a lot of time in here, but just I want to give you guys an idea on some of the different kinds of data that you can that you can get to see as part of uh, big data. Um, so there is structured data. Um, which is which is something that you would see on Excel sheet, you would see on on a simple Oracle server that is relational databases. And there is also semi-structured data when it comes to big data. And there is also unstructured data where there is just no structure at all. I'll give you guys an example of what is semi-structured and unstructured. If you take an email um, for a vendor, so let's say for example, I I am uh, I'm, uh, um, I, 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 I run an organization and I, I collect emails from customers. They send me emails. And if I want to analyze that data, um, it is both semi-structured and unstructured because it's unstructured. If you look at the content of the email, that is unstructured. How do you make sense out of that data? There is no structure to it. So that's it's, it's unstructured. And we use MongoDB and CouchDB. To, uh, mostly MongoDB is something that is very, very common in the industry right now when it comes to unstructured data. Semi-structured data, even with an email, there are certain elements that are semi-structured. If you look at the subject line of the email, if you look at who was the sender or who was the receiver of the email, at what time did it, got, did it get delivered or what time did it get sent, all these, all these data can be stored as a semi-structured data. So yeah, so that's to give you guys a flavor of all the databases that 
that you can use to hold big data. Okay. Um, again, there's a lot of things here. Um, I'm not going to touch upon it. Uh, I will touch upon it, but I won't go into a lot of details because this itself can take a full hour if I were to talk about it. Um, but just some highlights with this. When it comes to traditional uh, data warehousing, this is the common process. This is traditional, and this is the latest. And if you look at the traditional one, you have your resources. Say, for example, I have a point of sale system where I bring in my sales for every customer. Um, that data and many other uh, databases, all the data from it gets into a data warehouse. And from the data warehouse, so data warehouse is nothing but a database of all databases together, all data get, getting dumped into there, um, and then getting into, uh, um, getting into a point where uh, tools such as reporting tools such as uh, Tableau can, can use. Um, that data. Now, uh, what we use here, what happens in the background is called ETL. ETL is nothing but extract, transform, and load. So you want, you want to extract all the data that you have from here. You want to transform that data into um, the way you want to look at it. You want to cleanse that data, and then you want to load it all into a warehouse. This is traditional. Many of you might know it. If you are a computer professional, you know that this is something that is common in any company. Now, we are changing, we are moving away from ETL, extract, transform, load, to extract, load, and transform, ELT, when it comes to um, big data. And the reason behind that is that when it comes to big data, there is no data warehouse. There is something called the data lake, um, mostly supported by a framework called Hadoop, where all the data is getting dumped. Regardless of whether it's structured data, unstructured data, everything gets dumped. There is no cleaning that happens when everything gets dumped into it. Um, when it, so that's why it's extract and load, and the transformation happens at the time um, somebody wants to use that data, and that's how um, it works. Okay, so that was about big data. I uh, hope you got um, a good idea on what uh, big data is. And uh, as I said, my objective uh, from this uh, webinar is that it's more like um, a parent um, showing their children pointing at the sky to say, you know what, just look at the beautiful sky, look at the universe, how beautiful it is, look at the billions of uh, stars that you have. And I want to take that uh, analogy here, because when it comes to analytics, it's a universe. There's just so much within this field. And my objective from this webinar is that I want to point out to all of those to show to you guys that, you know what, there are so many things that are existing. And hopefully by the end of this webinar, um, I might have inspired you to, uh, to explore further um, so that uh, you can you can have a much more deeper learning into uh, into machine learning. Okay, so getting into machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence. Um, before we start off, I want to uh, give you some context on what that is. First of all, you may remember I said analytics also has a component of statistical analysis. So let's just talk about statistics. I know I heard that from Dr. Sobers that there are some actuarial students that might be some math or statistics uh, students as well. I'm pretty sure you'll be excited when you when you when you got to see the word statistics on this slide. Um, statistics is very important when it comes to analytics. However, statistics can be divided into two different uh, groups. One is descriptive, anything to do with how do I describe my data? How does my data look like in terms of metrics, in terms of uh, um, location metrics, mean and median? Um, how does the, uh, the the shape of data look like? Can I put it as a as a bell curve? Can I make it a histogram? Um, so that is one, uh, one side. But when it comes to machine learning or predictive analytics, you're talking about inferential data. The difference between descriptive analytics and uh, descriptive uh, statistics and, and inferential statistics is that with descriptive statistics, all that you are able to say is, now I know about the data. You gave me a billion records. Now I have a sense of that data. And that's what that is. When it comes to inferential data, it's not just about understanding the data. You're making comments. You're making inferences out of that data. You're pulling insights of that data so that you can make a decision out of it. So you're, you're going one step further uh, with statistics to say, what now, now that I know what the data is about, what can I do about it? So um, that is what is predictive analytics. Uh, it is one of the categories. Uh, let's not go into differences or relationship, but predictive analytics is all about now that I have historical data, with which I want my machine to learn about a pattern in the data, um, I want to use it for predictions in the future. Now, let's go um, further into it. Um, this is a question that I asked uh, some of the folks in my, uh, in my organization um, about what is machine learning. Uh, to be honest with you, 
Um, not a lot of people were, e were able to answer that question. They got into some technical jargons of what machine learning is or, or what predictive uh, modeling is. But let me make it very simple. Um, I strongly believe in, in teaching or talking to people in very simplistic terms. I think it's very important that you start off uh, very, very simply in, in such simple manner. And then if you want to go further, deeper than you could. But just to get the point across, I want to make sure that I make it very, very simple to you guys. When it comes to machine learning, machine learning is nothing but a mathematical equation. And that's it. I cannot make it any simpler than this. A machine learning model is nothing but a mathematical equation. Now let's get into it. How does a machine learning model work? So what you do is that you take historical data from the database. You have, imagine you have five years worth of transactions in your, in your database. You take all that historical data and then you apply a machine learning algorithm to it. So for example, linear regression, logistic regression, or any kind of machine learning algorithm into it. And with that, it spits out a model. And as I said, a model is nothing but a mathematical equation that you get. Um, once you have that completed, now your model is ready. Um, and for any kind of uh, new data that you have, oops, for any kind of new data that you have, you can take this new data and you can plug it into the model that you have already created. Remember, you took the historical data and you made the machine, you made your computer learn the patterns of the historical data. And with that patterns that it has learned, it has created a model. Now that you have a model, you're taking new data for which you need predictions. Just think about this. So let's say I want to understand, um, 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 let's say I'm, I'm taking five years worth of sales from my company and that's historical data. I created a model out of it. Now, now with new data, new data could be how many customers I have, how much I invested into this business, that is new data. With this, I will be able to put it into the model and the model will give me what is going to be your, your sales at the end of this year or in future, sometime two years ago, and the model will be able to do it. So basically there are two big stages when it comes to machine learning. One is model training. So you train a model. You, you, you train a model or you make a model learn the, the patterns in the data, and that's number one. Second thing is model scoring, which is about now that you have the data, you bring in new data. Uh, sorry, now that you have the model, you bring in new data with which you'll be able to do new predictions. So yeah, so as I said, mathematical equation, and it's a data mining process of taking historical uh, results, developing a model, and then you use it uh, for getting predictions for new data. Now let's get into uh, some of the types of uh, predictive modeling. Again, um, I do this in my class and uh, this could, uh, each of these could uh, take about a couple of hours to go through. So I'm not going to try even try to go into the depth of it, but just uh, on a high level, just know that uh, there are many kinds of uh, analysis that you could do. So there is something called regression analysis. Um, and a simple example of regression analysis is, um, as I said, Let's say you're investing into a company a certain amount of money. Let's say you're, if you spend X amount of money uh, as for your marketing, you would get Y amount of sales. And that's what that is. So that is linear regression. Logistic regression, for example, is um, if you want to predict in future, how many customers are going to stop shopping with me? Right now, let's say I have um, 50,000 customers that are shopping at my store. If I wanted to know as of uh, the next year, how many people out of the 50,000 will stop shopping with me? A logistic regression model will tell you. What can you do with that is that if you know prior to that event happening that 10,000 people out of 50,000 people are not going to shop with me anymore, all you could do would be uh, to take those 10,000 people and you may be able to send a promotion to them so that you can get those people and you can make sure that they retain in the business and the, you don't lose those customers. So that could be a use case of why you would want to use it. So regression analysis, you have classification analysis where you group uh, things into different buckets. You have cluster analysis um, and you also have association analysis. And I wanna talk about association analysis, specifically with market basket analysis. Amazon.com is one of the biggest companies. It, this is, it, is, it is not just a retailer, it's not just an e-com retailer, but at the same time, they're also a huge analytics uh, company as well. And the reason I say that is, if you think about this, I think this was the first company that came with the concept of frequently bought together. I purchased something, let's say I purchase a webcam, and then at the bottom, it's also going to tell me, now that you bought this, you may also be interested in this. And how is it happening? 
that's because they have a model behind. And the model that they have behind is a market basket analysis, with which all that they do is they look at historical transactions to see what did customers purchase when they purchase a webcam, what are the other things that they purchased, and with that, it basically takes a common denomination that says, this is what customers would be interested in. Um, yeah, so you could bucket them into supervised learning and unsupervised learning. Uh, again, as I said, I don't want to get into details, but this is supervised learning is all about taking historical data, um, which has got an outcome. And with that, you make the model learn. When it comes to unsupervised data, it is you all that you get is data, but there is no prediction involved. If you take an example of key means clustering, there is no prediction involved. All that you're doing is you're just clustering or you're grouping customers into different buckets. And that's what that is. Okay. Yeah, so there are a lot of use cases when it comes to predictive analytics and machine learning. And as I said, it is being used right now. And it's not anything of the future, it is happening right now. One great example is um, flight pricing. So say for example, if you were to go to um, um, any airline um, site in India, and if you were to look for prices, you might, have say, you might have seen that, okay, to fly to the US, it cost me, um, let's say 75,000 rupees. And uh, you might come back at night time and it might already be 78,000 rupees. And how did that happen? That's, that's only because there is a model running in the background where it is constantly watching for how many people have clicked on the site and, and wanted to know the price for a particular destination. And with that, it is able to know that there is a huge demand for this particular price. So let me rake up the price for that particular destination, for that particular group. And that's what's happening in the background. So dynamic pricing is a very, it's a classic uh, predictive model um, that is run in the background for airline companies. And um, um, what else can we talk about? Yeah, so let's also think, uh, let's also talk about within marketing, predicting lifetime, um, say, lifetime value of a customer. That is being used currently uh, in, a, in a company that I recently worked with where we, we try to predict the lifetime of a lifetime value of a customer at the time when they join. So think about this. Let's say I have in my business, I have somebody that spends, uh, let's say $50,000 in my business every year. And that's why I make sure that I, I treat them well. I give them as much offers as possible. But at the same time, there could be a customer that might have spent only, let's say $10. Um, I don't want to leave them alone. I don't want to ignore them. And the reason behind that is that though they have spent only $10 right now, there might be a huge potential with that customer. And how do I know whether they have that potential or not? It is just math. I'm just going to look at $50,000 versus $10. Somebody has spent so low, so I'm going to go with somebody that spent $50,000, right? But a model, a, a, a lifetime uh, value model is actually going to tell you, right now this person has spent only this much. However, they have a potential to spend $100,000. And that's what it is going to tell you. Based on that, um, you will, you will instead talk to that person and send them marketing offers instead of sending to the other customer. And that's what that is. And there are many other um, use cases. And uh, it is also used quite a bit in banks um, to prevent uh, fraud and, and any kind of credit risk. Okay. Moving on. We just spoke about it. Um, in every organization, within every field, analytics is being used. Machine learning is being used. Okay. So that is the end of uh, Internet of Things. Sorry, that is the end of uh, machine learning. Um, I want to uh, spend the next few minutes talking about Internet of Things. Internet of Things is probably one of the um, most, uh, I would say that is uh, the latest thing that happened. I know there are some technical definition when it comes to internet. And again, I wanna make it very simple to you guys. And uh, then after that, you could go into some uh, deeper learning. Um, internet of Things is, uh, just think about it as little robots in your home talking to each other. And that is what is Internet of Things. I cannot, I cannot um, explain it in, in any, uh, any simpler terms. It's just little robots talking to each other, communicating to each other um, within your home. Uh, let's take an example. Um, there are, uh, I don't know if this is common in, in India, but at least in Canada and the US, um, there are many systems. Um, for example, um, there is something called Google Nest, which is a thermostat um, for, for AC or for heating systems. There is a thermostat that we have based on patterns, based on outside patterns, whether it's summer or winter, it is able to automatically um, uh, change the temperature. And uh, if you take another example, it also learns there are sensors in every, uh, every such device where it learns to see if um, there are people, if there are humans in the house. Say for example, if somebody, uh, if a whole family would be out to school or to, 
um, or to uh, college or to, uh, to, to their workplace uh, from nine o'clock up until five o'clock. And it learns that there's just nobody in the home from nine to five. And based on that, it would just shut it down automatically. And it would bring it back again at 5 p.m. And how is it able to do is that it just is able to learn. Um, so basically, this is just a set of computing devices embedded in every uh, everyday object, um, like a Fitbit. Let's take an example of Fitbit. Um, think about what, what happens with Fitbit. Many of you might have a Fitbit. You have a Fitbit watch that you wore in the morning. You did probably you did yoga or you did some exercise. You went for walking. And then um, um, in the evening, if you just take your phone up and you open up an app, your Fitbit app, and the app actually knows how many, how many steps you took, how much calories you burned. How did that happen? That's because it is Internet of Things. Your Fitbit, is, uh, if your Fitbit has got um, sensors with which it has known how, what kind of activity you did, and it is able to transmit and communicate all that data to your phone. So that is, that could, that is a simple example of what Internet of Things is. And there are many others um, that you could uh, think about. Uh, one classic example that I have in my own household is that I have a Google Home um, with which I'm able to just talk to Google Home to say, hey, Google, switch on um, the light uh, bulb in my bedroom, and it's able to do it. And how is it able to do it? Is that um, Google Home is able to communicate with that smart bulb that I have in a different floor in, in my bedroom. We touched upon this a little bit. How does it work? Um, just think about the fact that it's all about sensors. Um, again, um, it's not just, uh, when it comes to IoT, it's not just going to be analytics professionals. It's not just going to be IT professionals. There is going to be a lot of engineers. Um, I think it's uh, um, electronic, specifically electronic engineers that will be in market, uh, that will be in high demand because sensors is all that you need for um, internet of things to work. There are two things that you need. One is sensors, different kinds of sensors. Um, you want to be able to have optical sensors. You want to be able to have thermal sensors and, and all such kinds of sensors uh, to be able to read that data. And you also need internet. And these are the two things that are actually needed. Um, yeah, so it basically uh, works as a nervous system. Just as we have central nervous system, this is digital nervous system that, uh, that enables internet of things. Uh, quickly, if you were to think about what has been the evolution. So if you think about, let's say, 1980s, what we had was we didn't have internet at that time. I think internet came about in 1990s. We had interactions or communications between human to human. Then it became an internet of content. We wanted to dump all the content into uh, the World Wide Web. Then we then came all the e-com sites with which you are having an internet of uh, services. Then it became internet of people because you started communicating to people virtually uh, with the advent of social media. Now with Internet of Things, it's even much more futuristic because it is mission to mission communication. There is no human intervention in, involved here. Missions are able to communicate with each other and they are able to make a decision. So it's not a, the next big thing. It is the big thing that is happening right now. I want to show, I know I have been talking quite a bit right now. Um, I just wanted to lighten up the moment. Um, so please look at this cartoon. So what you're seeing here is that uh, um, this is a smart device, a speaker, a, a smart speaker, uh, where you could see what kind of communications have happened across all of these different devices. Your phone told your Fitbit that, you, that told your Nest so basically, this guy has, got, has had an argument with his wife over the phone, and the phone has communicated that information to the Fitbit, and that has communicated to the Google Nest, and that has communicated to the Sonos um, audio system that you owe your wife an apology. So it says, please make sure that uh, you say sorry to your wife, or um, it is also trying to sell. It is also trying to use that as a marketing opportunity, and it says, Two, two dozen red roses are only thirty dollars for a limited time. So make sure you. So systems are tracking every little bit of uh, human behavior and says, now that I know that you owe an apology to your wife, just make sure that you buy roses and make her peaceful and happy. Okay. Um, one other example of IoT is that this is this is uh, it is not mainstream yet, but there are many companies um, like Samsung where they are testing out a few things where. Um, within a refrigerator, you have sensors which, which determine what kind of items that you have in stock within your fridge. 
say, for example, if you ran out of milk or, or butter for that, uh, for that reason, um, it will be able to automatically talk to uh, a mobile phone and place an order on amazon.com and uh, so that um, you don't even have to worry about what you have in your fridge or what you do not have in your fridge. Uh, the next moment or the next day, you will see milk and butter um, delivered at your doorstep. And that's all being powered by Internet of Things. You need to think about, uh, now that we've talked about all of that, how do we make, uh, how do we, uh, make advantage of, uh, of all of that? I will have one more slide for Internet of Things and we're done. We, I want to get into um, some of the tips that I want to give to everybody. I'll uh, give you guys a moment to look at this. It's a funny cartoon. So let me walk you guys through what is actually happening. This could actually be the future of advertising. Right now, advertising is happening quite a bit online, quite a bit on TV and everything. But you think about this. This is actually your, your, all the equipment that you have in your house could actually talk to you and you, they can sell something to you. So um, say, for example, if your bulb is not working well anymore, it is going to die. A light bulb can actually talk to you and say, oh, here it is on sale. Make sure that you, you, create, you, you get a new one. And if you are keeping on using your phone for quite a bit of time, it may say, you seem to be very distracted. Try a drug. Try a drug so that you won't be distracted anymore. And um, even your bowel uh, can become a smart device sometime in future, where it might say, mm, I have seen that in the past 30 minutes, you have not even eaten any, any of my chips. So basically, it looks like you don't like this anymore. So I'm going to recommend to you a different product, and, and so on and so forth, And just to give you an idea. So basically, um, you could be in a, in, a, in a time, you could live in a time in future where all the systems, all the devices around you might be talking to you and they might be talking to each other and they might be giving you, um, um, selling you items. One last thing um, before we go on to the tips, a thought for the day. This is from Nikola Tesla, and this is, uh, this is a scientist um, that has inspired me so much, and I'm pretty sure it might be the case with many of you guys as well. So that's why I wanted to share this quote from Nikola Tesla. Think about this, guys. He has actually talked about internet. He has talked about wireless technology. He has talked about internet connectivity, internet connectivity, and he has also touched upon um, internet of things as well. And remember, this is a guy who was born in 1856. We're talking about over 160 years ago. This has been a person that has had this futuristic thinking where he says uh, the whole world would be a huge brain where everybody is able to communicate with each other, irrespective of the distance. I think it's amazing. And what is happening right now is that I'm being about 10,000 kilometers away, I think, in Canada. I'm able to talk to, you all, to, to all of you. And I think it's amazing that a person like Nicola has been able to predict that, um, and he had that futuristic vision. Okay, so with that, um, this is going to be the last leg or the last section of the webinar. Um, oh, before we get into that, any questions uh, so far? Dr. Sobers, can we open it up uh, for um, questions in the chat box? Uh, yes, sir, yes, sir. Uh, we have already Please opened that, and we have uh, uh, consolidated it, sir. Can I ask you one by one, sir? I'm ready. Yeah, please go ahead. Yes, sir. The first yeah, the plan that I have is may maybe let's take five minutes for this, and then the um, rest of the slides will take five more minutes, and I will wrap it up. Okay, sir. So the first question that we have got here is, is it possible that there will be no place to store any more data in future? Is it a possibility? Okay. That's a very good question. Uh, this is something that anybody might think. Uh, but you also have to think about the fact that um, the trends that we live in right now, um, though we have so much data that is getting generated in, in the internet, in organizations, at the same time, you also have to think about that there is another technological advancement that is happening. And that is in terms of databases and, uh, and, uh, and also uh, the technologies behind databases um, on how much data it can store. So the answer to that would be that I don't think we will have a problem because um, databases are being are, are scaling up in such uh, such a manner that uh, data will not be able to catch up. Companies like Google, um, they I, I don't know the stats exactly, but they they hold a huge percentage of volume of the data that uh, we have in the internet. 
and they are growing. They have data centers everywhere. They have data centers in almost every, uh, every country. They even have data centers underneath uh, water in the ocean. They have data centers. So, um, sorry, not inside the water, but they have it in ships. They have it everywhere. So I don't see that a problem. I don't think we will get to a place where we have more data than how much we can store. Maybe a single company might feel, oh, I don't have enough space anymore, so I don't want to store data. But if you think about the whole world, I don't think we will get into a, into a problem. But if there is a small organization that is thinking, I don't have data anymore, my suggestion would be to go for a, a cloud vendor, a, a Google a computing, cloud computing vendor like Google, where it is actually much cheaper to store data. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. The, the, moving on, sir. The second question is, uh, does data analytics require coding? Okay, good question. Um, I don't want to talk about it right now uh, because it is in one of my slides uh, coming up. Okay. But yes, it's definitely needed. Um, the quick answer is it's definitely needed, um, especially if you want to be somebody that will that wants to be a, a hardcore analytics person. If you want to be a business analytics person, that's a totally different story. You will still be depending on somebody that is a data analyst or a data scientist for all of that. But if you want to become a data analyst or a data scientist or a data engineer, you definitely need programming skills. Okay. So the third question is on predictive analytics. Uh, the question is, if the analyzer or the researcher proceeds with the predictions given by the predictive analytics, will the output be a successful one? Um, I don't know who, where this question came from, but I have a feeling if this was somebody with a statistics background, this might not have come up. And I'm saying that only because with any kind of predictive analytics, any kind of prediction that happens from a machine learning model, there is always a probability that goes with it. There is always a confidence level that goes with it. And what that means is that um, not everything will have a, a confidence level of 100%. There's a prediction. So prediction also has a probability, which means that this can happen or this might not happen. And the good thing is that statistics also tells you that there is, it also gives you the probability of that prediction happening. And as a, as a business person, you can take it or leave it. If you feel that you can, you can put a threshold, you can put a cutoff to say, if I see that the probability is over 90%, I will believe the prediction. If I see that it's under 90, I would ignore it and I will continue with what I want to use. So the answer is um, there could be certain times when it could go wrong. Um, but the good thing is that it comes out with predict uh, with the predict with the probability. So you have to go with the probability and think about whether I want to use it or do I not want to use it. Okay. So the next question is: um, Can the data analytics technique be used in educational field? How how can we use data analytics techniques in educational field? Hmm. Good question. <laughs> um, I'm thinking off the top of my head right now. Mm, honestly, I have not seen anybody. Uh, I have a feeling that this is a personal question from Dr. Sobers. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but um, uh, great question. I honestly have not seen um, any educational institution, uh, or at least I have not been involved with any educational institution that is doing it already. But I am able to think of some use cases for future. There Maybe there are some colleges that are using it. I don't know. Um, something like you could think about <clears throat> Say, for example, if you run um, if you run online online webinars. Say, for example, right now we live in the situation where uh, with COVID nineteen everything is different. Everything, all classes are delivered online. Um, you could think about having uh, an online application. Yes. Sorry, if you can. It's, yes. Yes. I got it. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I just noticed that uh, there is scribbling that is happening in the in the slide. I just got distracted. Um, so yes, so say for example, if you were to have an online tutorial site where you ask your students to go to the application, online application, and they, they take all the classes, you would be able to, there are systems that you could do, that you could use, even predictive analytics that you could use to see, um, there are heat mapping systems that you could use to see what are students interest, interested in. You could, you could look to see what are the things that uh, uh, students clicked on what are the things that students clicked on? Let's say, for example, if you had a curriculum, you had 10 different sections in a particular seminar, you can see what are the, let's say this is a, this is a self-study that somebody has to do, and it's an online application. Uh, you will be able to see what are the links that students clicked on, how did they navigate, um, and you would also be able to use heat mapping systems with which you would be able to see 
where did they look at? When they looked at the screen or when they moved their cursor, did they focus so much on this portion or did they focus so much on this portion? And based on that, you can do predictive modeling techniques. With that, you'd be able to make the uh, experience, the learning experience better. With that, you'll be able to see, I have not seen any of the students click on this link at all. Maybe it's not interesting to them. So let me just get, get rid of that. Or then you might also see, I don't like the way I have uh, I have uh, positioned my my text my, or my content within my site, within my learning site. With that, you might be able to say, uh, with a heat map thing system, I, you might say, this is where that, uh, students are looking at. So I'm going to clear all the clutter out and then just focus on um, just one portion. In summary, I would say you can look at some of the navigations that uh, your students have done. And based on that, you can make the learning experience better clear out something that the students are not interested in, and then uh, that way also understand who is uh, interested in, in your class, who is attentive in your class, and who is not. Yes, sir. Uh, sir uh, could we take one more question, please, sir? Yeah, let's go ahead. Yeah. Sir, sir. Uh, sir uh, the question is that, can we make data analytics work without internet? Say, for example, if we deploy it like in the forest, where there is uh, no or limited connectivity, is it possible to work them, make them work without internet, sir? Mm -hmm. You could totally do it. So if you think, I don't know in what use case would you be sitting at a forest and doing it, uh, but it's actually totally possible. Um, why I'm saying this is possible is all that you need. So let me go into some tools. You can have Python. Python is an open source. You don't have to pay for it. Um, not only students, everybody gets this free of cost, no license required, you can download it. You can download it on your laptop, you can go to a forest, and you can create your own model. But the main thing to understand is you need data, right? You cannot work with static data. If you think about a company, um, data is not static. Data is always dynamic. So there is new data that is constantly coming in. Um, so you also have to think about if I'm in a forest, how am I getting that new data into the system? Um, without internet, that is also going to be hard. Um, but just leaving that part alone, let's say, for example, somehow you have the infra infrastructure to get data in. Let's say there is uh, some um, some intranet that you have with which you all which you have data. You don't need internet at all because it, the machine learning model sits within uh, the Python program. Okay. Thank you, sir. Um, you can proceed, sir. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. So let's uh, go ahead with uh, the presentation. Um, as I said, I wanted to give you guys an idea on um, what you could oops, what you could uh, expect. So let's say, for example, you're new to the industry, um, you have just got into analytics industry, or you're thinking about getting into analytics industry, but you don't really know where to start. And this is something that I have seen from many people. Many people have asked me, even in, in the place in the university where I teach, uh, people ask me, how do I get into the field? Where do I start? So I wanted to give you guys three tips, very simple tips. Uh, that I want you guys to really think about and, and go ahead and do. First thing is you want to understand or you want to make up your mind on what role are you going to pick when it comes to analytics. There are at least, uh, a, there, I would say there are at least uh, um, four different um, roles that, that exist when it comes to analytics field. One is IT developer. IT developer is very common. It's not about building a software, but it is just about taking some of the models, deploying the models, uh, deploying the models in the server or moving the code to server or uh, or displaying it out um, as a website. So all that a dev IT developer would do. A data analyst is somebody that would be doing, you might remember the, the four different categories of analytics that we talked about. A data analyst is someone that might not need as much uh, statistics background, but they just should have a good business understanding and a good data understanding. With that, they will be able to create um, descriptive analytics and a little bit of prescriptive, a uh, little bit of uh, um, diagnostic analytics, and they'd be able to become a data analyst. Now, if you want to be a data scientist, data scientist, uh, for, for you to be a data scientist, either you need to be a statistician, you have a master's of statistics, or at least a bachelor's of, or, or bachelor's of statistics, or you have some good background on statistics, and um, you are building models, you're building machine learning models, then you're a data scientist. Say, for example, I'm not really worried too much about becoming a data scientist, However, I like analytics, but I have an IT developer background. You can become a data engineer. A data engineer is somebody that will just be working on creating that data pipeline between systems. Think about two different systems um, be, having to talk to each other. You're, you're creating a pipeline between um, the two, two different uh, systems that, uh, that send out big data. 
building out that pipeline is done by somebody called the data engineer. So these are four different roles that you may want to choose. Second thing is, first thing that you want to do, somebody asked this question on, uh, do we really need to know programming? It's actually definitely a programmer, um, or at least a statistician. Even statisticians, if you look at math, math plot, uh, anything to do with statistics, um, it might not just be with, uh, with, you cannot create a mathematical model these days without programming. You need to do some kind of programming to be able to do mathematical uh, modeling or programming. So um, I would say go to the internet um, and, uh, and look at some of the options that you have. I'm going to tell you about four different options in terms of learning a data science tool. One is Python. Python freely available. You don't have to pay a single penny and you can get Python. Um, so you can learn Python or SAS. SAS is very expensive. If you're already part of an organization that uses SAS or uh, at, at the Bishop uh, Heber College, let's say if you already have a license for SAS, go for it. Apache Spark is something that is coming up big, especially when it comes to big data. Apache Spark is amazing, and there is a lot of requirements, a lot of demand for Apache Spark. Last one is MongoDB. It's not a data science tool. As I said, MongoDB is a database that can hold unstructured data, and that is something that you could learn as well. Last one. The third one that I want to talk about is uh, you also want to take a machine learning course. I just gave you guys a primer or an introduction to all that you want to think about um, when it comes to uh, the top trends in analytics. But you really want to go through a proper course, at least about uh, that would take about a month or so for you to just go through it in and out. Um, so think about some of uh, the courses that you can find online. Um, I have, I personally have taken many courses in Udemy um, at work. In my, in, my, um, in my workplace, we have licenses for Udemy. Even if that's not the case, even as a student, you can, you can, get, uh, you can sign up for a course and you can just go through uh, a machine learning course. Um, say, for example, logistic regression or, or linear regression, you just go through the whole thing. Coursera, LinkedIn, and Khan Academy, um, name it. Um, you, can, you can pick any of these um, sites for learning. So guys, uh, that's it. This is the end of uh, my deck. And I wanted to say that I uh, hope you all enjoyed the session. And uh, it was not, I hope it all that you heard was not just blah, blah, blah. You heard something more than that. And I hope that you had some um, strong takeaways out of the session. And I hopefully did not kill you all with all those uh, slides that I had um, today, but you had some good learning out of it. So. Thank you, everyone, and, uh, and I wish you all the very best. And uh, if you want to stay connected with me, please feel free to I've just uh, drop my LinkedIn profile there. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, uh, Dr. Sobers, uh, Thank and you. thanks, uh, Newbegin, um, Professor Newbegin, for the opportunity. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, we were uh, enthralled by your uh, uh, lecture today, sir. Your presentation was so crisp, and uh, we could learn a lot of new things, new insights we got, sir. Thank you so much. For spending your very much, you know, sir, valuable time with us, sharing your uh, expertise with us. Thank you so much, sir. We are overwhelmed by your uh, depth in the knowledge of uh, uh, in your domain, sir. Thank you so much, sir. On behalf of the PG Department of Computer Science, Bishop Weber College, I thank you, sir, uh, for the uh, for your sparing your time and your presentation. Thank you, sir. I thank all the participants for your active participation in uh, today's webinar. I uh, hope you had a good learning session today and uh, that is shown in the chat box. We have got so much of response from the uh, audience. And I suggest the audiences uh, that uh, the video of uh, today's webinar session is available in our YouTube channel. Kindly stay tuned uh, to avail it. Uh, the edited version will be available from tomorrow. The broadcast version will be there in our channel from today onwards. So kindly visit our channel uh, to watch it over again and again. And one more announcement, kindly submit your feedback form uh, to the link. We have got some problems with the feedback form here, I suppose, in the chat boxes, and it has been uh, uh, corrected now. And the feedback link will be closed automatically by 9.30 PM. You can submit your feedbacks up to 9.30 PM. Thank you. Thank you very much, on and all. Thank you. Thank you.